Good evening, everyone. And uh, a big welcome uh, to the CIW annual lecture for 2021 and keynote address at the Chinese Studies Association of Australia conference, which is being proudly hosted by the Australian Centre on China in the World at ANU. My name is Ben Hillman, and I am interim director of the Australian Centre on China in the World. Tonight, it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Wan Ming Sun. Uh, professor Sun is a uh, professor of media and communication in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at the University of Technology, Sydney. A fellow of the Australian Academy of the Humanities since 2016, Professor Sun is currently a member of the Australian Research Council's College of Experts. She's a specialist in Chinese media and cultural studies and is best known for her work on rural to urban migration and social change in contemporary China, as well as such topics as soft power, public diplomacy and diasporic, diasporic Chinese studies. We're very fortunate to have Professor Sun speaking with us tonight on a topic of great interest uh, in the scholarly community and uh, in the public uh, more broadly. And her talk is entitled Watchdog or Guard Dog, Australian Media and the China Threat. We're very much looking forward to this. Professor Sun will speak for approximately 40 minutes, followed by Q&A. Over to you, Professor Sun, and a big welcome. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for that nice introduction. Um, you can hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, hi everyone, uh, I'm speaking to you today from the inner west of Sydney, which is the traditional land of the Gadigal and the Wongo people of the Euro nation. So I'd like to acknowledge the country and to pay my respect to elders past and present. And also I uh, would like to thank Jane Golly and the uh, committee and the CIW for inviting me to give this lecture. I know that to speak on this occasion is a, is, is a great honor. Last month, Scott Morrison went to Glasgow when, where he accidentally said that it's time to tackle China. What he really meant to say is time to tackle climate change. This Freudian sleep, which was only reported after Chinese social media had gone viral with it, is very telling. Is it possible that in the mind of a PM, China may be more of a threat to Australia than climate change. And of course, like Peter Dutton, he wants Australia to know that he's tackling China not to win an election, but for the security of our nation. So as an academic, a media academic, I now have a new research question. How do the media produce knowledge about the country, which is increasingly imagined as our national enemy? Is Australia's public well informed about China? Or are we being fed, drip fed, a Cold War rhetoric? My talk today is my first step in thinking through these questions. I want to ask what is the politics of the China threat narrative? How is truth established about the China threat? Whose voice counts? in the media's production of public knowledge about China. I should warn you, I won't be talking about bias or the media's tendency towards negative news. I have no problem with either biased or negative reporting. An unbiased journalist is after all, a dead journalist. If I want positive news, I can go straight to China's biggest news agency, Xinhua. No, I'm talking about something else, something far more systematic and fundamental. I should say that uh, today I'm talking about Australian media, not Chinese media. I have done plenty of uh, research in the Chinese media in my early life. And I'm focusing on news and the current affairs content. My, current, uh, my focus on news is deliberate. 
As the media scholar John Hartley argues, news is the most important textual system in the world. He also argues that journalism is the most authoritative sense-making practice of modernity. Which is why I found it curious that ABC's recent review of its China reporting made a decision not to focus on day-to-day -day news. Eric Jensen is the founding editor of the Saturday paper. And in his 2019 pen lecture, he commented on the inability of the media industry to take on criticism. Journalism, he says, might be the only industry in the world where being told you are wrong is taken as proof that you're right. When I heard this, I felt he's really taking the words out of my mouth. I was very impressed with his capacity for self-criticism. This seems so rare in media industry, in the media industry. Jensen mentioned um, racism and Islamophobia, and he mentioned a masculine culture in the newsroom, but he didn't mention Sinophobia. So I was left wondering, if the media needs to reflect on themselves, should this expand, extend to their coverage of China? In other words, does reporting on an enemy state exempt the media from accountability? I will go on this talk on the assumption that uh, most of you would agree with me that China coverage should not get exemption from accountability and that we should talk about its power, its responsibility and its accountability. From the start of China's economic reform, reforms till about a decade ago, Australia's China narrative hinges on two themes, opportunity and threat. But in recent years, the opportunity trope had got lost in the China threat narrative. So what explains this growing sense of threat? Well, international relations scholar Pan Chengxing thinks that the West desires ontological security. But when this desire for certainty by identity is not met, it takes the shape of fear and anxiety. So to put it simply, once upon a time, Australia knew its place in the world and had a clear sense of who, who we are. America was our friend and ally and China was the ultimate other. But China's economic reforms was an evidence that the other was becoming more like us and that along with these economic reforms, China might democratize, in, in other words, becoming even more like us. But then Xi Jinping took over and made it clear that it's here to stay. China no longer wants to lie low and is not in a hurry to democratize. Now, China wants what the US wants and he wants it now. As David Goodman says, what China threatens is the supremacy of the US, not its sovereignty, democracy, and values. For Australia, what is being threatened is certainty about whether we can continue to rely on the US, and if not, how we should position ourselves between the two big powers. Gradually, it seems that our confidence about who we are as a nation is coming undone. This new uncertainty helps explain why China, once again, after a few decades of becoming more like us, is reverting to its original status as the ultimate other. Interestingly, Australia has become actually more proactive than the US in fostering the fear of China. 
as David Brophy observes, Australia hasn't been just been Australia hasn't just been quick to sign up for a new Cold War with China. They've been urging the US along the way to join the war. Cold War journalism was born about a few decades ago, but the Cold War mindset didn't disappear when the Berlin Wall came down. Instead, it lies dormant, waiting to resurface in response to new situations. And then we are witnessing a renewal of it now. Over the past few years, there has been a shift from the so-called objective journalism to what I called adversarial journalism. This brand of journalism is tailor-made for China and has little to do with the media being the fourth estate. It replaces news values with anti-CPC values. And this agenda dictates what kind of stories readers should read, how these stories are told, and what conclusions readers should draw. The implicit assumption is that China now is a hostile nation, so objectivity is no longer necessary. And since the West sees communism, communism as patently evil, there's no need to make any effort to understand it. In media studies, a variety of canine metaphors are used to describe the relationship between media and power elites. For example, the media in liberal democracies are expected to function as a watchdog, scrutinize the government and power elites on behalf of the public. In contrast to the watchdog model, the guard dog model sees the media performing as sentries, not for the community as a whole, but for powerful groups. In guard dog journalism, says media scholar George Donahue, the focus and the approach of the news organization are shaped according to who is being protected and who is defined as the threat. So what we see now in Australia is a curious coexistence of watchdog and guard dog. In reporting domestic politics, the watchdog is alive and alert. It takes on the PM, the prime ministers, the bank, and all powerful institutions. But when it comes to domestic politics of our China policy, the watchdog is missing in action. Where are the investigations into behind the scene pressure on Australia? David Brophy asked. He also asked, where are the investigations of Australia's decision-making about China? Citing an example of the much hyped spy story, remember the spy stories about Wang Li Wang Liqiang? Brophy asked, where is the accountability of media when stories like this come unstuck? But I think the most spectacular example of media having all power and no accountability is the joint ABC Fairfax investigation into Chinese influence for Four Corners in 2017. Curiously, ABC chose another episode of the Four Corners for review of its China content, and the 2017 episode was conspicuously left out. And as far as I can see, the program is the defining moment where the quality of the nation's China-influenced journalism went seriously downhill. The episode highlighted the problem of political donations in Australian politics, which is good. But it also made a range of claims which are not convincingly substantiated. The episode resu actually resulted in two defamation uh, cases against the ABC and Fairfax. The ABC and the Fairfax lost one defamation case and settled in another. The litigation in the second case was a Chinese student in Canberra 
who said she was happy with the settlement, but she was bound by a non-disclosure clause. In other words, she cannot speak to others, to the public. But none of these problems seem to reduce the negative impact the program had. Until today, this episode is widely credited with the introduction of Australia's foreign interference legislation. Pierre Bourdieu described the process of imposing the norms of the powerful group on those of the subordinate groups as symbolic violence. This violence is not physical, but it can be just as injurious to those who have no cultural and media resources to fight back. This episode of Four Corners has cast a long and a dark shadow over our Chinese Australian communities ever since and the reputational damage to the individuals involved could be irreparable. But the program has issued no retractions or corrections, let alone apologies, let alone apologies towards any individuals. Usually when people complain to journalists about their stories, their response is, oh, you may not like it, but this is what we do, we're journalists. But Jensen says this response is not good enough. His point is that media shouldn't expect to have all power and no responsibility. And I want to add that it's not good enough simply to say that we are publishing a story in a national interest, as if the media had a monopoly over what counts as public interest or national interest for that matter. Operating on this guard dog model, the media are on standby to report on gratuitous remarks made from bank, uh, bank, venture, uh, bank, uh, bank, bank ventures politicians to quote our securities and intelligence agencies who issued yet another warnings about China threat and to give space to security analysts whose new report raised fresh concerns about China. For those Chinese Australians, it seems the only legitimate voice is that of the dissidents. As Chen Yang Yang observes, regardless of your research direction of quotas, you must say outright that you're critical of China's policy on Xinjiang and Hong Kong. Unless you do that, you won't be seen as credible. You won't be seen as credible. Chen was talking about what's happening in the US. But the same logic is also playing itself out in Australia. A few people I know of my own age have commented that this seems eerily similar to what was happening during the Cultural Revolution, when people were told to be to avoid persecution. Biaotai in Chinese means something like declare your views to see, to indicate which side you're on. But mind you, giving, I think giving voice to the CPC critics and then calling out China's human rights issues is important, especially given that these voices are not allowed in China. But media seems to forget that between those dissidents and those who work for the CPC. There is a silent majority whose political views come in 50 shades of gray, even within the Mandarin community, Mandarin speaking community. And not everyone wants to be a card carrying dissident, even though they don't support the CPC. The media typically don't trust Chinese community organizations and their leaders and suspect them of being linked to the United Front. The media also don't trust WeChat as a source of community sentiment, since it's subject to censorship from China. And as for Chinese students, the media mostly portray them as hot-headed, angry mobs, or even possible spies for the Chinese embassy. Neither are China-born scholars trusted. A couple of years ago, a security researcher in Melbourne wrote that uh, Australian universities should only hire homegrown political scientists working on China, 
rather than hiring people that were educated in China. At that time, at the moment, China bonds uh, scientists are feeling the heat and the scrutiny without knowing exactly what they have done wrong. Given this attitude, I'm wondering whether some people, some Australians could take my talk today as evidence that no matter how long I have been here in Australia, I'm still not one of us. Many Chinese Australians feel that they have no legitimate platform on which to speak, let alone talk back. A constant comment on WeChat is that we have no voice. I'm reminded here of Gayatri Spivak's observation. And she says, it's not that a subaltern cannot speak, it's that the colonial masters don't want to listen. While the term fifth column is mostly directed at the Chinese Australians, language bullets such as CPC agents are freely fired at any non-Chinese commentators and scholars who hold a complex position and who dare to argue for critical engagement with China. These days, the media amplify the fear of China threat, but seldom acknowledge the fear of people who are subjected to witch hunt. Media tells, tell us that people both here and in China dare not speak for fear of persecution by the CPC. But don't mention that more and more people here practice self-censorship because they fear the label of a Beijing apologist. Such politics of fear is quite familiar to people who either lived through the Cold War in the US or the Cultural Revolution in China. I now want to say something about the notion that of expertise, China expertise. Like climate change, understanding China requires specialized knowledge. China is mostly beyond the expertise of the public. So journalists have to seek the views of the China expert. But China experts have different ideological positions and come from different disciplines. And nobody from the China studies community can speak on behalf of all. But too often the media don't re reflect this internal difference. So the public gets the impression of their chosen expert speaking as an uncontested authority. And too often the same scholar is interviewed again and again, not necessarily because they are the most qualified person, but because they're willing to talk and are probably likely to deliver the expected line. Journalists complain to me that most China scholars don't return their calls, but they seldom ask why. One China scholar said to me that he doesn't want to talk to the media because news about China these days is no longer about facts. And he said, it's about which side you're on. Some scholars are worried about having their views taken out of context or simply being left out if what they're saying doesn't fit the narrative being pushed. And worse still, some may worry that may be cited favorably in China's state media, which in turn can be taken as evidence of their being a Beijing apologist. But who are the, who are the experts? The word expert is bandied about a lot. But China scholars and the China watchers are two different species, as far as I can see. Most China watchers are current informal journalists, most of them. Many of them know, not, know little about China, but as they present themselves as being really reasonable and cosmopolitan and uh, knowledgeable, the public, the public who knows even less about China, sees no reason to doubt their words. Respected China scholars 
usually take pains to qualify and substantiate the point they're making. It needs to, if you, they need to interview the people, they have to go through the vigorous ethic approval of the process. And in order to have their work published, they have to go through a ruthless peer review process. In contrast, many China watchers are supremely confident and articulate. After staying in China, they might claim to have found the truth about China or to have divined the real intention of the CCP or claim to know the inner thoughts of Xi Jinping. This is despite the fact that China, some are, to quote Paul Keating, all tip and no iceberg as far as their knowledge about China is concerned. Some of you may say the problem with China reporting is that media have too little knowledge about China. So we need to improve media's China literacy. I don't entirely agree with th this view because I've seen some very knowledgeable China scholars lending credibility to China phobia discourse. I actually think that not knowing China is one thing, but not wanting to know China is something else. In fact, not knowing anything makes it easy, somehow, somehow even easier because you won't have to deal with inconvenient knowledge. Interestingly, some Chinese experts, China uh, watchers, I'm often promoted to the status of experts. One China critic is described in his own paper as the global expert tracking the rise of China. As one uh, Australian, um, Chinese Australian writer jokingly observes, if you hear a break, if you hear a brick randomly, you can be sure to hit at least one or two China watches. Now, the security and intelligence establishments concern about China threat is one thing, but establishing this threat in the public imagination requires the media to collaborate actively. The media also need to give the impression that their news stories are natural and logical rather than ideologically predetermined. So the reader believe that this is the only story worth telling, and there's only one way of framing this story. A couple of years ago, a promotion campaign for Sydney Morning Herald was plastered on buses and the billboards. The slogan says, and I quote, in exposing Beijing's ambitions, the Herald promises to shine a light on hidden influences using hard news to expose soft power. And in order to achieve this, the Herald also said, we will do whatever it takes to break the stories. We do whatever it takes to break the stories. Often, constructing the threat narrative involves using a wide range of ready-made tropes. These tropes can be mixed and matched to suit specific palettes depending on who the readers are. For instance, if Orientalism is too subtle for some readers, then try plain old racism. Anti-communism always does the trick. For extra flavor, a touch of sensationalism never fails to work its magic. The tabloid's approach is crude, but effective. Add a touch of yellow peril, a pinch of red scare, a tinge of a green fear, and a hint of white supremacy, and stir. But more often than not, establishing the dominance of a threat narrative needs some additional storytelling strategies. The first is what I call the artful use of headlines. I remember writing an article for a paper about how China's soft power efforts in Australia was not really working. But the editor decided to call it, China's soft power alive and well in Australia. 
quite a few China scholars have told me that uh, they were horrified to find that the editors have given their articles a misleading or more sensational title. Second is the cherry picking of facts. For instance, a recent 60 Minutes program on the possibility of war with China over Taiwan focused on Joe Biden's gaffe about America's commitment to Taiwan, but conveniently left out White House's later retraction of the statement. Also, you can try using disclaimers. After a few defamation cases, journalists have realized that, oh, to accuse someone of being a spy or foreign agent may land them in legal troubles. So some now take to saying, this paper is not suggesting blah, blah, blah. But you then go on to say things like, questions are being asked about so and so's relationship with CCP, or concerns have been raised, blah, blah, blah. In other words, insinuation often works well. You could simply imply that somebody's dodgy because they are in the same photos as a Chinese diplomat or attended the same conference as a visiting CPC member. Connected, linked, associated are the operative words here. And oh, some advice for your production crew if you are looking for some visual fodder for television. And if there's no hard evidence and testimonies, try creating an eerie atmosphere. Spooky music, dark silhouette, finger typing furiously on the keyboard, and a cinematic mise en scene befitting a John Carey story. These few tricks working together should allow you to dress up opinion as news so that your news stories actually promote, works to promote someone's opinion. Like the stories of the boogeyman, the China thread has become a stock narrative. That's because the details of these stories change from day to day, but the framework remains the same. Journalists may believe they're pursuing the truth and fighting a nasty regime, you know, motivated by the ambition of for a walkly or moral self-righteousness, they search for scoops and try to break new stories. But in reality, the stories, theme, angle, and the plot are already written even before they arrive on the scene or even before they were born. Instead of the journalist writing story, I think very often it's the story is waiting to write itself. And above all, in lieu of investigative journalism, access journalism has become the most popular game in town. This is a kind of reporting in which the journalist claims exclusive access to some government agency effective operating as its mouthpiece. According to Peter Manning, formerly with the ABC's Four Corners, access journalists usually report an allegation and do not either prove or disapprove the allegation. And they use evidence that is based on sources who cannot be named and therefore cannot be verified. Many says that access journalism mostly serves the agenda of only one side of any debate. The big blind spot in our journalism in relation to China, therefore, leads to some really curious paradox. For instance, when security and intelligence infringe on the media's own freedom to report, the media are indignant. But when it comes to China, security experts become media's best friend. Also, Journalists usually privilege professionalism over patriotism. But when it comes to China, the media, politicians, and the government join forces as Team Australia. Also, our media regularly mock Xi Jinping's monolithic China story. But our own media's China story is no less monolithic. 
I want to stress that although ABC News has largely failed to play a leadership role in shaping the direction of the debate, some of its radio shows have far more depth and in insight. Also, while news reporting in the commercial media is single-minded in pursuing the China threat line, there is some diversity of opinion in these papers. I should also give kudos, kudos to the National Press Club for hosting China's deputy ambassador, Wang Xining. I think this decision is a sign of confidence in the robustness of a democracy. Now, if you did a survey of Australian journalists about the standard of their media coverage of China, I'm pretty sure you'd be likely to get a very glowing report. There have been reviews of China coverage, but they were either internal or were done by current or former journalists. And not surprisingly, they've given themselves a pat on the back. Could do even better, report usually says, but all is well, nothing to see here. For Eric Jensen, these reviews will not pass the pub test. Jensen believes that such reviews should not be internal. He says that they need to be, that in fact, he, needs, he argues that they need to be conducted with the assistance of people excluded from our industry and in the presence of views that have been dismissed or overlooked. And they need to be conducted by people who, according to him, do not look like me. So news is about, it's not just about telling the truth, it's also a product, a, commun a, 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 a commodity it needs to sell. When market logic meets Cold War logic in response to China's rise, the China threat narrative becomes inevitable. Selling raw emotions such as fear and anxiety about the other is a godsend business strategy for media organizations struggling to stay afloat in the era of internet click culture. Because of this, even though I know some journalists, individuals that are very thoughtful and reflective of their practice, I am on the whole pessimistic about journalism as an industry and an institution. I hold a somewhat dim view about whether they're capable of changing or whether they want to change. But at least I think they should stop pretending that their China reporting still play the role of the fourth estate. At a very minimum, they should ask themselves these questions, such as, can we truly be democratic if the principle of truth telling is no longer applied evenly across the board? Is it possible for Cold War journalism and liberal journalism to coexist, coexist in one media system or to have a one country, two media practices? I think if we can't change how the media operate, at least we can change ourselves. Rather than hoping for more China literacy in our media, we, by we, I mean the Australian public, need to develop, develop media literacy. That is, we need to educate ourselves about how the production of knowledge is bound up with unequal power relations. We need, we need to watch the China watchers and ask why they're doing so and how they come to adopt certain positions. And more importantly, we need to find a way of letting the media know if we're not happy with them. I believe China is too important for us to get wrong as a nation. And our country and we as citizens and taxpayers, as readers deserve better. <laughs>